this is a topic that as Evan's introduction suggests is near and dear to my heart and I'm sure to yours as well. So I thought it might be appropriate to begin uh, my lecture a little differently than I often begin an academic lecture. I want to begin by talking about a little of my own personal journey, a little autobiographically. Uh, I was uh, born into a family with pretty good parents. Uh, we attended church an awful lot. I'm a Christian. I began at an early age to commit my life to Christ over and over and over. Uh, by the time I was in high school, there was one particular event that I look back to as very decisive in my deciding to become a Christian. My parents were loving. I mean, they weren't perfect, but they were better than average. Uh, the Christian community I was a part of was probably better than average. Uh, I was a person who took my faith very seriously. I went to uh, college and uh, became very active in evangelism and apologetics. I did a lot of door-to-door -door witnessing. I was a part of Campus Crusade for Christ. I would go to bars and begin conversations with, do you know about Jesus Christ? I was one of those kind of people. <laughs> um, this really was at the core of who I was. I believe that uh, the kingdom of God was at stake. Our eternal destinies were on the line. Uh, I still believe that. But my methods uh, were very aggressive. Then my senior year of college, I took a class in philosophy of religion. Now, because I took my faith so seriously, I read an awful lot. And when I got in conversations with most people, I could win the debate because, you know, I did my homework and I thought I had all the right answers and, you know, I had this inerrant Bible that proved everything I said. And this philosophy of religion class turned my world upside down. For the first time, I read serious arguments from atheists or those of, from other theological traditions that kind of pulled the rug out from underneath me. The really slam dunk arguments I thought I had no longer seemed like slam dunks. And I'll never forget my senior year of college, pulling up in my car to pick up my fiance in the midst of this time of struggle in my life and me turning to her and saying, I just can't believe in God anymore. I was a person studying to be a minister, um, and here was my fiance, who's now my wife. Fortunately, she stuck with me. <laughs> you know, what are we going to do? You don't believe in the God whom you're supposed to be preparing to proclaim and to preach and to be a minister. I wasn't an atheist for very long, only a few months. I began to piece together reasons why I thought it was more plausible than not that God exists. And a part of that piecing together involved uh, looking for meaning in life, looking for purpose, and above all, love. I came to believe that the very core of what it meant to make sense out of reality were the issues of love, that there must be a source of love that we in the Christian tradition and other theistic traditions call God, that I would be called to love, to live a life of love. And it's the issues of love that began to to reshape the way I thought about not only who God is and how I ought to act, but also how I ought to do evangelism. I uh, do it a little differently these days than I used to do it. Um, but that began then a quest. This happened oh, 25, 30 years ago. This, this began a quest in my life to try to make better sense out of love because as we all know, that love is, as one of my favorite theologians like to, likes to say, a weasel word. It has a lot of different meanings, a lot of different understandings and definitions. So today I want to talk a little bit about the kind of result of my research, the kinds of things that I personally have come to believe are at the very core of what love is all about. Not everyone in this room is going to agree with me, I know that. But I want to propose these sorts of ideas as a way to help perhaps, if not help you to uh, find your own definition, at least for you to look at this and say, hmm, that's, that might be helpful as I think about my own research, my own life, my own journey. So I'm looking at, as my title says, uh, love's essential aspects and diverse forms. Now, when we talk about love, there are certain people who say, you know what, trying to find the essence of love, trying to give a definition of love, that's a fool's game. I mean, love is used in speech in such a wide variety of ways. Why even give a definition of what love is? Let's just look 
the way, look to see how love is used in a particular text or particular language. So the first question that I want to face or talk about this morning is, should we even define love or ponder its core or speculate on its essential aspects? I think we do need to do that, but uh, let me begin with some of the more influential philosophical literature here, and I want to look at uh, a set of books uh, done by Irving Singer some time ago in which he goes through the major literature speaking about love from Plato to the present and ask questions about what love is doing in the particular literature. What does it mean? What's going on? And he aims to be primarily analytic. He aims to be someone who's not trying to you know, prescribe what should be the right definition of love. He's saying, look, this is what the philosophers, the theologians, the poets, the romantics, this is what folks have been saying throughout the centuries love is all about. When he gets done with these three volumes, he really hasn't given us what he thinks love is. <laughs> so he writes yet another little book in which he tries to sum up everything he did in the three previous books. And a couple of quotes from that book I think are, are instructive to give you an idea of his approach. He says, my trilogy, The Nature of Love, tried to make sense of the historical progression of thought and inspiration about love within a framework of distinctions that I myself imposed and that reflected whatever analytic talent I might have. Reflecting on what I myself have done, I see only a string of approximations and reconsiderations without any reason to think that I'm either closer to or more distant from an all-inclusive statement. In a subsequent book, he tries to distinguish between what he calls bestowal love and appraisal love. And I think that helps us get a little bit closer to understanding what love is. But I use him as a, representa a representative of someone who is not trying to give us the right definition of love or at least prescribe what we might consider to be the best definition of love, but as someone who's trying to analyze and then at the end of the day say, these are all the possibilities. I think this approach has some real limitations, however. And I summarize those limitations by my first answer to the question. I put it this way. Those who claim merely to analyze how love is used in language show by what they select for analysis and by the results of their work that they presuppose some meaning or meanings of love. In other words, I think even in the attempts to just be purely analytic, to not take any sort of bias into it, at the end of the day, you start to see some certain biases creep in. And I think that's just fine and dandy. I just think we need to be clear at the outset that that might just happen. In deciding what we think is important, language or literature on love, uh, some of our own presuppositions and biases might come into play. But the second answer to my question is even more, is even closer to my own heart. I said that I'm a Christian. As I read the Christian scriptures, I see over and over again claims about love and their normative claims. Their claims that saying, this is how I ought to act. And I know many of you in the room are Christians as well. These uh, phrases or these passages that I'm going to put up here might not be new to you. But I want you to think about what's going on in each of the, uh, oh, I've probably got about 15 or so phrases here for us to look at. Love the Lord your God. Deuteronomy, Luke, and other New Testament passages. Love your neighbor as yourself. Show your love for the alien. Love your enemies. For God so loved the world that he gave. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Love one another in the way that I have loved you. One of my favorite passages. Imitate God as beloved children and live a life of love. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love is patient. Love is kind. And many of you who know this particular passage know it goes on and on. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. If you are loving your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. Whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Let all that you do be done in love. 
I'm not writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. In other words, I think it's important for at least Christians and those of other theistic traditions who think that love is at the center of who God is and how we ought to act, I think it's crucial for us to have some idea of what this love thing is. Um, Sometimes people say, well, I don't need a definition of love. I just want to be a loving person. And I say, well, how do you know if you're a loving person if you don't know what love is? We need to have something at the core. So my second answer is, those who believe that God, through Scripture, calls them to love should have some idea of what love means. And I think a definition seems necessary. So what does the literature provide for us? Well, as you know, it's all over the board. Love is desire. It would be hard to overestimate the power, influence, and force of Plato on discussions of love. Uh, He says a lot of things about love. It's not uh, exactly clear all the time what he means by love, but at the, at the, the center of it is often this claim that there's a desire aspect of love, that it's desire to pr- possess or obtain or achieve the good. And this idea has radically influenced the Christian tradition. We see it especially in Augustine. Uh, love, but see to it what you love. I personally think the desire element is important, but it cannot in and of itself give us everything we need to know and and affirm about love. After all, if we want to desire the good and we also want to love our enemies, it seems like there's some questions about our enemies good? Uh, What's going on here? Is is, Is love more than just desire and how do you know the good? Deep questions. In fact, there's a strong strand in the Christian tradition that I don't particularly like, and I'm probably going to offend a bunch of people by saying this. There's a strong strand in the Christian tradition that uses this word love primarily as aiming toward what one believes is of ultimate concern, to use the language of Paul Tillich. That love isn't primarily about doing the good. Love is primarily about where we're aiming for what we're worshiping. One of my good friends, Jamie Smith, has a new book out derived from some of his previous works. It it is called uh, You Are What You Love. And the idea is that you shape your lives around the habits of things that you desire. I think that's an important idea. I just wish we wouldn't put the word love with it. Because in my way of thinking, love always has to do with well-being. And we can love things wrongly in this kind of tradition. I think we ought to have a different word than love there. Desire is a good word. But desire in and it of itself, to me, doesn't give us a full explanation of what I think love is. There are other people who describe love primarily in terms of feelings. Helen Fisher calls love a feeling of elation. If you look up in most dictionaries, this is the way love is often defined. One that I happened to look at before I came to this conference says, love is an intense feeling of deep affection. I think that is partly true, at least some of the time. But again, loving your enemies, I don't feel deep affection for the people who have wronged me. I don't think this quite sums up the biblical claims about loving those who have hurt us, of turning the other cheek. I think there's some aspect of feeling and motion in most forms of love, but feeling in and of itself, it doesn't seem to give us everything we need. There are others who emphasize the importance of love as a choice. I also think love is a choice. Eric Fromm, for instance, calls uh, love a decision or a judgment. But as you might guess, I don't think choice in and of itself tells us everything about love. Then there's been a strong emphasis, I think, in more recent days, about emphasizing love primarily as relationship. One of my favorite uh, philosophers, Charles Hartshorn, says, love is life-sharing or the realization in oneself of the desires and experiences of others. Or Vincent Brumers calls it a reciprocal relation. I think Paul Tillich's notion of the reuniting of that which was separated has also something to do with this kind of relationality inherent in love. I'm big into relationships. I think the world is interrelated all the way down. So I think relationships are core to not only humans, but all of existence. But I don't think relationships in and of themselves 
tell us everything we ought to say about what love is. The one that I oftentimes emphasize is this one, love as well-being, or love does good. Shalom, eudaimonia, flourishing, genuine happiness, blessedness, abundant life, healing, salvation. All of these words, I think, are at the very core of what love is, but in and of themselves, they also can't tell us everything about love. After all, sometimes people do good when their motives were to do evil. And I don't think that's a good way to talk about love. If I intentionally want to harm you, and it turns out you end up getting blessed in some ways, I don't think you ought to say to me, boy, you're sure a loving person. So it's got to be more than just consequences that are good. Although goodness and well-being, I think, are really important. And then finally, the the theological traditions have argued about how it is that love is connected to God. And there are different proposals on the table. I'll talk a little bit about those, my own preferences there. But most of us who do believe in God think that in some way, love comes from God or is God. There's all kinds of different ways of talking about this. I like this phrase from John's uh, letter, we love because God first loved us. So given all of this, all of these options, each of which I think gives us something helpful, I, in my own scholarship and life, have tried to pull together what I think I find helpful to, in a concise way, which is really hard to do, in a concise way, offer a definition I at least find helpful. So here goes. This is how I define love. To love is to act intentionally in sympathetic or empathetic response to others, including God, to promote overall well-being. And there's actually a book that I wrote a few years ago that explores some of this in more detail. I want to, uh, I see some of you are writing this down. I'm going to talk about each phrase individually. So if you don't get it here, you're going to get it in the next few slides. So what do I mean by saying love involves acting intentionally? Well, first of all, I don't think we ought to call accidental things acts of love. As my previous illustration suggested, if I try to do harm to somebody and I accidentally end up doing well, that doesn't seem to be uh, an act of love. Or even if I'm not trying to do harm, but just some luck or chance events ends up up promoting overall well-being, I don't think we ought to say, well, that's obviously an act of love. Now, there's some people have some views of divine action who will say that there are no chance and luck things and God must have done that. I'm not in that camp. I think there is real luck and randomness in the world. So when I think about the accidents that bring about positive results, I don't want to call those things loving. I think, whoops. We lost you for a second. All righty. I think motives matter. I think our motives Consequences do matter, but our motives ought to be for good consequences. And so when we think about ethics and we think about what we think is loving, we ought to ask the question, what did the person intend? What was the person's motives? So when I talk about loving as acting intentionally, I want to include the motive aspect. Third, and this is a little more hidden in this particular phrase, I think love involves some measure of freedom. I call it limited freedom. I don't think we're free to do absolutely anything, but those of you who know the philosophical traditions, I'm a libertarian in that sense. I think that we genuinely choose amongst options. I'm not a libertarian in the political sense, but I'm a libertarian in the philosophical sense. We choose amongst real options, but those options are always limited, always limited by our background, our culture, our community, our biology, our histories, our personalities, and yet nonetheless, we have some choices. So love is not forced, it's not coerced, there's some options at play, even for God, I believe. This particular lecture, I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, divine love, we'll have some time for questions, if you want to ask me about those, I can do that. But I think even God's love is limited in some ways. But God's, I mean, I'm sorry, God's freedom is limited in some ways. God's love is unlimited in the sense that God loves everyone. But God's freedom is even limited in some ways. There's some things God can't do because to do them would be being undivine. 
Uh, let's see. Let's see if I can remember the fourth thing I was going to say. Uh, motive. Oh, cool. Excellent. Good timing. Ah, there we go. Some folks, when they see me talk about or hear me talk about love as action, they say, yeah, but sometimes, wh- how do you understand prayer then or meditation? No one's acting when they meditate or when they pray. And I say, no, I think that is real action. It may not be bodily movement. But um, our thoughts, thinking good thoughts, those kinds of things are real actions, even if we don't necessarily see something happen through uh, bodily movements. So those are some of the things I had in mind by talking about that first phrase, that love involves acting intentionally. The second phrase, in sympathetic or empathetic response to God, including others, is a strong emphasis upon the relationality I think is inherent in love. We are interrelated. Who I am is partly determined by who you are and who my surroundings are. Not entirely determined, but partly. We are relational beings, and love is a relational activity. Now, when I first started constructing this uh, particular definition, I used the word sympathy exclusively. I've been trained in philosophy of religion, and in philosophy, the word sympathy, at least in some of the American philosophers, uh, has a feeling of, uh, uh, has a, a, a connotation of feeling with, sympathy, feeling with. But when I threw out this definition to some of my psychologist friends, they were like, oh no, sympathy is not the right word, because for them, sympathy meant pity. And so they said, what you really mean is empathy. And I thought to myself, well, you know what philosophers mean by sympathy, you're saying is empathy, and so it doesn't matter to me which one you like better. I'm using these words interchangeably. Sympathy and empathy. Those things have some sort of emotional response. There's oftentimes a great deal of emotion involved in love. It doesn't have to necessarily be so, but oftentimes there's a great deal of emotion. Some of you have done more work and research on the emotions of love than I have and can speak much more eloquently on this. But I'm a person who thinks that um, there's oftentimes deep levels of emotion and different kinds of emotions. Sometimes, however, emotions are fairly minimal and they may not be directly related to the particular subject at hand. We seem to be emotional beings at our core, even some of those of us who have uh, brain damage and don't have the same kind of emotions as other people. There's still some emotionality. And this particular part of the phrase is intended to account for the emotions inherent in love. And then finally, I think love requires divine action. I don't think you have to believe in God to love but because I think God is omnipresent and the source of all love, even those who don't believe in God are inspired to love unconsciously because God is active in their life. I think all events begin with God's, what we say in my Wesleyan tradition, prevenient grace. God acts first, we can respond, but we rely upon God's loving presence to empower us to respond, and therefore our love requires God's initial action. Because God is faithful and loving, God will always provide that empowering action for our response, but we are, to use uh, uh, Schleiermacher's phrase, we are utterly dependent upon God for our uh, love. So those are some of the things I have in mind for the second part of my definition. And then finally, the last part of my definition involves promoting overall well-being. When I talk about overall well-being, I have in mind this general notion of the common good that ethicists oftentimes talk about. One of my colleagues who's actually here, uh, Joe Banker and I, oftentimes discuss this, of whether or not this has to be a utilitarian kind of uh, notion. This emphasis upon overall strikes some philosophers as utilitarian ethics. Um, I'm not a utilitarian ethicist, although I do find some things valuable about utilitarian ethics. I think some of the problems with utilitarianism have to do with uh, being able to assess or discern how you get the greatest good uh, for the greatest number, but also some of them have to do with the interrelationality. It's hard to discern how the relationships will end up affecting one person or another. Uh, Finally, I think that there are probably some fundamental or basic rights that we all have that have to be... uh, preserved or upheld when we try to understand what it means to promote overall well-being. But what I like about the utilitarian aspect is that utilitarian ethics asks us to think about the big picture. 
Utilitarian ethics asks us to talk about the common good, the overall well-being. And sometimes when we think about love, we're so focused on the one individual that we're doing good for the one at the expense of the many. And that is what I call unjust. And the justice issue, as I'll say, I think in a moment here, is really important. The other aspect about the word overall in well-being is that um, oftentimes people think that love is always doing something for somebody else. But I think there's a healthy sense of self-love. I teach a class on love every semester at my university, and the first day I ask them to give me their definitions of love to see where they're at. And almost everybody says, well, love is doing something for the other or desiring the other. And I say, well, what about the self? Is there any possibility you can do something good for yourself and that be genuinely loving? Now, those of you who know the Christian tradition know there's been a debate on that. I'm in the camp that says, yep, you can love yourself. In fact, you ought to love yourself because God loves you. And this emphasis upon overall well-being is to try to include this aspect of self-love as well. Uh, Then here's the justice issue as well. Um, I think it's important for us to understand uh, our acts in the world as having some sort of contribution and affecting the whole. Um, Actually, Nick Wolterstorff has written a nice book here recently on this relationship between justice and love. I think justice here, I'm not using it in the retributive kind of way, the idea of eye for eye, you do this, I'm going to get back revenge in some way. Justice here is this idea that we need to think about the whole. We need to distribute the the goods to uh, as many as possible as we try to think about what the loving act is. And that's hard. It's really hard. I've got three daughters that were going into, actually, the, my, my youngest is going to be in college next year, my middle daughter is in college, and my oldest daughter is in grad school. I'm paying big bucks for them to go to school, right? And it's difficult to know what's the most just thing to do when there's other people in this world who could use that money for probably even more basic things. Why would I give a bunch of money to my kids and not use that same money other places? Those are difficult questions. And actually, I'm going to talk a little bit about that more in a second here. But that's the kinds of questions that we have to ask each other when we're talking about promoting overall well-being. Okay, so that's answering the first part of it, the essential aspects of love, my definition of love. Now I want to move on to the different forms of love. And here, when I talk about forms of love, I'm talking about all kinds of forms, but I want to begin with the ones that philosophers oftentimes focus on. The three Greek words, agape, eros, and phileo. Now, I think of each of these words as particular ways to think about love, not in opposition or alternatives to love. For instance, I'm not of the opinion that we ought to call Christian love agape and secular love eros or something like that. I want to provide a definition of love And then underneath that, those things that we think are forms of love have to adhere to the definition. So that means as I look at scripture and the way that the word agape is is used, I find, boy, scripture doesn't have one way to talk about agape. It's all over the board. Um, The writers of scripture use the word agape in a lot of ways. John tells us God loved the world so much that he gave his son, which sounds like an awfully good thing to do. Love there is agape. Paul writes in one of his letters to Demas, don't love the world. Agape is the same word there. And yet, in one instance, loving the world is good. In another instance, loving the world is bad. Agape doesn't have a uniform definition in Scripture. So that means I have to ask myself, okay, what do I think are kind of the major ways that agape is used? What are the uh, uh, the, the, the instances in Scripture which I find most common. And so, as a form of love, I define agape in this way. Agape is a form of love that promotes overall well-being, like all forms of love do, according to my definition, when responding to activity that generates ill-being. So something bad happens, I respond by promoting overall well-being. I don't take revenge. I'm, it might be an act of forgiveness. It might be an act of reconstruction. I like to call it in spite of love. In spite of what happened to me or to others, that's difficult, that's bad, 
I am going to do good. I am going to repay the evil done with something good. That's how I understand agape. In spite of the bad, I will do the good. Eros, then, is similarly defined as another form of love that promotes overall well-being, but here, appropriating the way eros is often termed, uh, used in literature as pertaining to value or beauty, eros is a form of love that promotes overall well-being when appreciating or seeking to enhance beauty or value, or as I like to say it, it's because of love. There's something about you or that thing or what's going on that I find attractive, that I find helpful, interesting, beautiful, valuable. So I appreciate that. I appreciate that value, and I can enhance that value in my response to promoting well-being. So eros is because of love. In spite of love for agape, because of love for eros. And then the third form of love, philea, because again, it's another form of love. It's going to share in common the idea that it promotes overall well-being, but it does so by seeking to develop cooperation, friendship, or solidarity. It's alongside of love, to use my little pet phrase again. It joins with others to do what's good. Now, each of these loves are oftentimes intermingled, intermixed. One might predominate. Uh, when my daughter comes in at 3 o'clock in the morning and I'm not really happy with her, I'm going to love her with agape by repaying evil with good. But I'm also someone who has philea. I want to join with her. We're part of a family. And we want to, I'll, I'll frame it in the sense of this is who we are. And we want to be the kind of people who do good in the world to each other and as a unit. And, and of course, I find value in my daughter. And I appreciate that. And I want to enhance that for her own good. So these aren't like totally separated kinds of loves, but sometimes one predominates. When someone does something harmful to me, it's agape that's probably the one that I'm thinking about most. I'm going to try to repay this evil with something good. Finally, I guess there's a couple more slides. Uh, I want to end, though, in talking about other forms of love. Uh, love has many, takes many, many, many different forms. Love is a many splendored thing. Stephen Post, whom you'll hear later on in uh, one of the lectures, has written an awful lot of good things about love. This particular book here, Why Good Things Happen to Good People, is one of my favorites because in this book, uh, Stephen has eight or ten chapters in which he talks about particular ways love is expressed, particular forms of love. And I'm not going to be able to go through all of those. If you want to talk to him about those, he's sitting over here if you haven't met him yet. Uh, but that's a really good book to think about practical ways or forms of love expressed in the world. One of the most uh, important ones is the uh, form of love, compassion. Now notice I'm saying this is a form of love. I actually believe that compassion in and of itself doesn't have to be loving. You can have feelings of compassion without actually then responding by doing something good. Um, that passage in James that I quoted earlier, then it says that Paul, or James says, when you see someone in need and, you, and you, you see that and you say, go on your own way, you're not actually helping them, that might be a, a compassionate feeling. You see they're in a horrible situation and you feel bad, but you just don't do anything about it. That can be compassion that isn't really love. Um, Lynn Underwood expresses this in a few paragraphs really well in her, the book she edited, The Science of Compassionate Love, that compassion in and of itself is not necessarily love, but it oftentimes leads to love because of the motives involved. Another form of love is romance and sex. Um, my particular theological tradition has a fairly conservative stance on the world. And most of the time when I hear sermons on love, the preacher begins by saying God's love is different from sexual love, and they end up sounding as if sex and romance are bad things at the end of the day. Um, I think sex and romance are not in and of themselves loving. I can think of sex that is unloving, but they are also sometimes profound, deep, incredible expressions of love. And I think the literature needs, to, or we as uh, who are theists, who believe that sexual and romantic love is important need to do a better job of articulating that in ways that can help uh, the larger community. Werner Jean Ron's uh, book does that in a few chapters really well. Forgiveness. Forgiveness 
doesn't necessarily involve love. It oftentimes does, but forgiveness is a powerful form of love in when it becomes agape, repaying evil with good, turning the other cheek. There are some times in which forgiveness cannot be, it doesn't promote overall well-being. Uh, we can forgive for, with the wrong motives in mind. Maybe we forgive simply because we just don't want uh, to have to face uh, criticism again, or we're afraid to stand up to oppression and uh, those who have are abused us. But forgiveness can be a powerful form of love. Self-sacrifice may or may not be a form of love. Oftentimes is, but sometimes people self-sacrifice for the wrong reasons. A couple of books here that talk about this. Eric's uh, here in his particular book. He talks about how uh, loving others can be good for ourselves. Love can be special as well. Thomas Aquinas talks about this. We can express particular kinds of love for those we feel special obligations toward. This is what I tell myself when I write the big checks for my daughters when they're in school. I say, okay, I made a decision to have sex with my wife a long time ago to raise this family. Now I have certain obligations to try to treat them well in the world. Um, it's still, it's not easy for me to know exactly how much money I ought to spend on my kids instead of some other kids in some part of the world that have greater needs. But that's part of what it means to try to understand my obligations, my responsibilities, given my past actions, decisions, and goals. And then finally, I have not talked any in this particular lecture about what it means to become a loving person. I've talked about love primarily in terms of acts in and of themselves. But I think these kinds of acts done repeatedly begins to shape character, begins to develop habits in us that then makes us certain kinds of people. Again, in my tradition, this is called having Christ-like character. Becoming like Jesus Christ means having certain dispositions, certain ways of living in the world that shapes who I am. And being that loving person, no matter if it's a Christian tradition or other traditions, those are the kinds of things that, that can occur because we repeatedly, intentionally respond to others because God has inspired us to promote overall well-being. So the summary of that is, love takes many forms. All forms of love involve acting intentionally in response to others, including God, to promote overall well-being. We become loving people, love more consistently, with habits of love when we repeatedly choose to love. And various practices, rituals, and communities incline us toward becoming loving people. That ended up about the exact length I wanted to. We got about 10 minutes for a Q&A, right? Excellent. Questions? Uh, let's see. Yes, I can. Yep. Yes. Sure. What is it? What do you mean? Can you be a little more specific? Like, so, what does it involve? Or yeah, so you say to love is an act intentionally in sympathetic uh, empathic response to others mm -hmm. um, to promote overall well-being. So yeah. When I'm asking, is that when I'm thinking an act of love towards my wife? Um, it seems like it's a very individual subject. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. To others. Yeah. So by others, I mean uh, to overall is the word I use there. Um, I think love is almost always individual or local or group related. Um, when I say, it's really hard for me to say, I'm loving all universe simultaneously in one particular act. Now, I want to take into account as best I can the widest array of factors that I know about when I make this decision. But when I love my wife, I do specific things for her, right? And those sometimes involve the three forms of love I have up here, right? My, my wife is my best friend, so it's really easy for me to talk about phileo love. I, I think there's a lot of valuable things about my, love, my wife, so eros is there. Sometimes my wife does things to me that aren't very nice. She's not perfect. <laughs> Maybe some of you have perfect spouses. I don't have one. <laughs> I'm not always perfect to my wife. 
So in those instances, I have to repay what I think is evil with good. And that the, the particular ways those are expressed, they're just all over the board. Yeah. Well, uh, what I'm saying is that when, you, when I act for my wife, the, her good, I also probably need to account for the wider community that I have. There may be some instances in which I am not loving toward the whole because I do too much for my wife. So I have to think about, you know, you can imagine a scenario in which a husband uh, neglects his children because he spends all of his time on his wife. He's not taking into account the whole of the family in that instance. So um, that's what I mean by talking about the overall well-being. Again, you can't, in my view, uh, epistemically, you can't be able to, you can't gauge all the factors, but you are responsible for trying to take into account as much as you can. Thanks. Yes, Stephen. Oh, thank you. No, you're not, Stephen. <laughs> I want to try something out on you. Okay. okay. The, the meaning of love, the basic core definition that stays away from ancient languages and the like. I take it from uh, Harry Stack Sullivan, the great interviewer for Paul Harvey, his best high schools. Um, he calls himself the chief inventor, the most hmm. successful. of a grandchild, do you feel their security, their well-being is as meaningful to me as my yeah, own? I like Probably, that. in that case, more so. And if you're talking over a cup of latte with an old friend who's struggling with life and a lost job, same kind of thing. If you're Cicely Saunders, who felt called to help people who were dying, remember that talk she gave when she said she still goes into St. Christopher's? Mm. Uh, Jean Vanier, you know, I mean, so, so whatever situation I think of in life, and that includes more romantic marital relationships and so forth, when I think of Sullivan's definition of it, you know, it's well being and the security of the individual, the security of those who feel more meaningful to me as my own, mm. possibly more so. I love that person. Mm. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, and it's easier to see in person kind of relationships, I think, than others. I actually want my definition to be so broad as to also include acting for the well-being of non-humans. So, for instance, um, I don't think the well-being of my poodle is on the same par as mine. However, I think my, well, my poodle does have well-being, and I act for my, well, the well-being of my poodle, but there's sometimes I impose certain sacrifices on my poodle for my well-being, especially in the middle of the night when she wants to go outside and I'm tired. <laughs> so um, I do think there's something powerful there. You're, you're looking at the other, and you're seeing value in, there, in them, and you're acting for that. Um, but there may be some creatures on this planet whom I think have genuine intrinsic value but I'm willing to uh, override their well-being for my well-being because I think it promotes overall well-being. I especially do that with mosquitoes. <laughs> Along those lines, then, what you were talking about, and it's affecting more than just the one person, the more that we truly love in a godly way, and going back to what you're saying, if we're loving ourselves, because that's what the scripture says, mm -hmm.
I think so. At least, yeah. Uh, some, all of society may not directly benefit, but I think it does have a ripple effect. Yeah, great, great comment. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. I'm interested to see how wide or maybe focused it is. I'm thinking of um, the very virtuous person who, and it even popped up at the end here, who, who habituates themselves mm -hmm. to like, an act for the world of being in the world. Um, and so, you know, a few years, a few decades down the road, uh, it's, it's so natural for them to act in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I was hoping you were going to go there, yeah. <laughs> but then I think, and this is not just right, charting the waters, I'm thinking like really important acts of love. Not just I'm, I'm busy, this is important, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm really busy, I have a lot of my mind. I come home, I'm like, just to, to share some time. I've habituated myself to, to, to be there. So I don't kill myself consciously. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He's really busy doing cross stuff. He's not cursing people in his heart or calling down angels and praying for people. Yeah, yeah. These are important acts of love, it seems like. I think so. And I think my response would be, um, there's still a measure of intentionality there, but it's not in sort of very deliberate, you know, what should I do in this moment kind of a thing. And actually, my eschatology suggests that uh, we can develop to a place where our characters are such which we can intentionally choose love far into eternity. But that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> uh, actually, I saw this hand, then I'll come over to you, Steve, and then Bob. Did you have your hand? No, no. Okay, was that the same question? or? No, it's different. Okay. I guess the tension, I, I would love to see the, well, okay, maybe 30 seconds, if it's between, um, loving yourself is love as giving to yourself, love as dying. Mm. So, Excellent. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great question. Some people never unite them. They think love is either being self-sacrificial, I get nothing good out of it, or it's all about me. I have to love myself, and then only can I love other persons. Um, I don't th like either of those alternatives. I think we d it depends on what overall being requires in a particular situation. Sometimes I'm self-sacrificial. This morning when I got up, I was brushing my teeth. I was acting for my own good. I mean, I guess I was worrying about you ha smelling my breath if it was too bad. But it was mostly for my own good. I was doing something that would benefit me, and I felt no guilt whatsoever because I was loving myself. Um, so there are some times in which self-sacrifice is required. Other times I do things primarily for my own good and not anybody else's. But often those acting for myself and for others has mutual benefit. And so it's not a clear cut, you know, I get all the good and nobody else does, or they get all the good and I don't get any kind of a thing. All right, I think I saw Steve's hand next. Okay. And a number of issues come to mind uh, with respect to, say, torture. Do I, can I kill my enemies and promote their overall well-being? But let me make it more concrete. My uncle Skeeter died, and that's his real name. Rural Indiana farm. He was suffering in a nursing home and was suffering. And he wanted someone to kill him. How would your definition help me know how I should handle my uncle Skeeter? It may not give you the direct help you want. It gives you an overall framework. You have to say to yourself, what should I do here to promote overall well-being? You and Eric might come to different conclusions. So it's a situational effort. It's situational in the sense that the context matters, yes. But it's not situational in the sense that it's whatever seems to work best in the situation. It's sort of a relativism. But my point is that this particular definition, people can affirm this definition and have differing views on abortion or you know, all kinds of these kinds of debates that we have. The question is, how do you defend whatever view you have on abortion or your uncle or whatever in light of the question of how does it promote overall well-being? That's the issue. Great question. Thanks so much. Thanks,